morning and welcome to the webinar and good afternoon to uh, our participants from China. Um, this is the second webinar in the series organized by China Europe Water Platform together with our partners from Aquatech uh, Shanghai, from IWA China, from EU SME Center. And uh, we are uh, very happy to have this meeting and this opportunity today. We are in a series of webinars where we are looking into the urban water uh, field. And <clears throat> we're looking into a field which is uh, characterized by quite a number of uh, challenges, but also uh, opportunities coming up. The challenges are quite well known to all of you. It is several areas with water scarcity, several areas with huge water quality problems. Uh, and is climate change coming up and enforcing and strengthening uh, in a negative manner all of these challenges. I'll take you through a few slides before we will go into the list of uh, speakers. And it will be so that. So. As you can see, several characteristics are shared between China and Europe. <clears throat> in both areas, we will have retrofitting of old urban areas with quite old uh, infrastructure. <clears throat> in China as well, we will have the new urban areas with an expected increase in urbanization coming up. The key char characteristics are huge levels. I'm of sorry, Henrik, we yes. don't see your screen. Ah. <clears throat> Hello? I'm sorry, hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully it's coming up now. Yes. So the key characteristics for the urban water infrastructure are huge levels of water leakages in quite many pipe systems. It's wastewater treatment plants who are not designed for uh, top modern uh, functioning, including resource recovery. It's digitalization only fully implemented in few places. And in quite many places, we don't have the key features of urban water management and infrastructure. Uh, integrated in uh, the same decision making. And all of that calls for a range of challenges and potentials which we cannot fully address. Today's meeting will uh, discuss these. We will look into to which extent that state of the art um, that state of the art solutions are actually uh, well they are available for the market but are they requested by the market? and what might be the difference between procuring state-of-the-art solutions or procuring bulk solutions. We will see that digitalization cannot be necessarily uh, achieved at full scale. What would that mean? <clears throat> and we will look into what are the barriers at governance uh, and various economic framework um, uh, situations. So, <clears throat> With all lot of challenges already existing and many coming up, are the existing solutions sufficient or do we need to look into innovating these even further? <clears throat> How much of the digitalization potential can be achieved? And one of the features here, if we cannot organize data <clears throat> collection and data sharing in efficient manners, we will not get the full potential of digitalization. We will look into the <clears throat> economic situation, the cross-sector valuing, and we will have to, in many places, face that we will not have abundance of finances available. And therefore, we should be able to look into where do we get most, basically, where most water for the money, including what does the long-term horizon and the long-term economic profile based on true cost of ownership, what does it look like? So with these 
few words. Uh, I will, in a few seconds, pass on the floor to Yuan Xiaoshu from uh, China Water Risk, who will look even further into the economic perspectives of water. One small detail for those of you who have not registered yet, I would urge you to make the registration also after uh, the meeting has taken place because it will allow me to uh, send you the feedback scheme and also allow me to keep you informed directly about upcoming uh, activities and information which will be available. We have our full scheme here. Uh, we have some technical problems with the first speaker, uh, Xiao Chang Wang from uh, IWA. So we will uh, change the sequence and start with Yuan Chao Shu. Uh, but otherwise, uh, the scheme here, which you, all of you should have achieved, will be what we're using. So um, with this, uh, I will pass on the, the floor to um, Yuan Chao Shu and hope you will all have a good webinar. Please use the chat for comments and questions. <clears throat> And hello. You're clear. Hello. Hello, Henry. Can you hear me? Hi, you're clear. You're clear. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning. And uh, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Good morning and uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks uh, for inviting me to give this speech on the uh, what are challenges of China right now. Uh, I'll go through with the slides. Uh, first, I'm going to make a short introduction about our uh, about us, uh, CWR. We are a think tank based in Hong Kong, uh, focusing on water. And we've written uh, plenty of reports and we've done a lot of research for financial institutions and the corporates and the government on water issues like water scarcity and water risk and uh, water pollution, something like that. Uh, here are our uh, reports. And you're you're all welcome to uh, scan the QR code there, and or go to our website to 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 get all the information you want. And uh, so first, let me give a the background of China China's water challenge. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we use a bathtub uh, water economics indicator as uh, to to showcase how much water uh, a country uses and a country has, like for example, for US, uh, US people, they average on average, each person uses 21 bathtubs of water a day. Uh, that's quite a lot. And the reason that why US people can use that much of water because it has a lot. It's, uh, uh, it has abundant water resources like here. Uh, it has 131 uh, bathtubs a day. So they can use 21 and they still have a lot. But for Asian countries like China and India and Iran, they only have like about 20. Uh, like for China, they have 28 bathtubs a day. And for Indian, uh, it only has 20 bathtubs a day. So definitely they can't use water as the US does. Uh, they have to find a new way of development for, for themselves. Uh, here are four maps of China and uh, respectively availability, water stress, groundwater depletion, and water pollution. Uh, all these five, uh, all these four indicators shows China's basic water challenges currently. Uh, let's look at this, like here availability, it's red, water stress is red, and the groundwater depletion is also red, and the pollution is also red. This place is called the North China Plain. Uh, it's here. And uh, let me just introduce uh, uh, shortly for how to read this map, because uh, there is a water poverty mark, which uh, less than a thousand cubic meter per capita per annum. Then uh, if your uh, water resource per capita per, gana, uh, per annum is less than a thousand cubic meters, then you then you are marked as gray, like here, 
in Gansu and Liaoning. However, if you are even more water scarce, like if you are uh, under 500 cubic meters per capita per annum, you are marked as red. Uh, like here, Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei, Shanxi, and Shandong, Henan, Shanghai. And this 11 provinces, we call it as dry 11. It, uh, uh, they account for 45% of China's GDP. And this circle is the North China Plain, and the, the water resource here is four to seven bathtubs. So it's quite water scarce. And uh, what's more, about 350 million people uh, living there, and uh, almost 30% of China's GDP is generated from this region. Uh, China has very limited resources, like, for example, 7% of the water resources, 8% of the arable land. But actually, China is providing, uh, is producing goods for the world, like 85% of the rare earths produced in China and 66% 60, uh, of the chemical fibers, for example, steel, coal, paper, cotton, something like that. Our question is that if China state remains in this status, can China still be uh, this the global manufacturer? So uh, the Chinese government has also realized this, uh, like this issue. And so starting from 2011, they have uh, uh, published a series of policies and regulations on uh, water resources. The most famous one is called the Three Red Lines, which uh, is three red lines respectively respectively for water total water used and water quota and uh, water efficiency and uh, water pollution uh let's see before 2011 like from 20 uh, 2004 to 2011 china's total water use has been increasing all the time to 610 billion cubic meters uh, in 2011. And uh, that's why the three red lines came out at 2011. And after that, in China's 13th fiber plan, and uh, the Chinese government came up with a dual control of water resources. Uh, there are two aspects. One is for the control of total water use, and two is the control of water use intensity, uh, which is also the water use efficiency. So the total water use uh, is supposed to be capped at 670 billion cubic meters by 2020. And uh, there are two indicators for uh, water use efficiency. One is water use per 10,000 GDP, and the other is water use per 10,000 value added of industry. They all have a target for uh, 2020, like a reduction from uh, 2015's number. So let's see how... Uh, how it went uh, since China published uh, a series, uh, the, these policies and regulations. The black line is the total water use. Uh, we can see like it's declining steadily, especially for this, for dark blue, is the industrial water use. It's, uh, it has declined a lot in the past 10 years. And also as well as, as, well as the agricultural water use. And the water use efficiency actually improved a lot. This is the uh, uh, one of the indicators: uh, water use per 10,000 GDP. It's declining in during 13th fire plan. Uh, now let's talk about the total uh, control of the total water use. So China has an old target, old water use tar target, which uh, like in three red lines. It has target for by 2020, it's 670. Um, by 2030, it's 700 billion cubic meters. And in during 13th fiber plan, China issued a new target, which actually it delayed the target from 2020 to 2025. It doesn't mean that China is not confident. Uh, it's the opposite. It's actually China has a set uh, has set an stricter target for itself. So in the old target, in 2025, the cap is about 690 uh, cubic, uh, billion cubic meters. But now in the new target, and uh, the total water use cap uh, has become 670 
uh, billion cubic meters. So China is quite confident in, in meeting all its targets. Let's see how, how, how it works, how it worked before. In 2015, China has a, a cap about 635 billion cubic meters. And this is the actual water use of the, the light blue is the actual water use of China. So it's far away from the uh, water use cap. We haven't got the number for 2020 actual water use yet. But uh, if we use 2019's number, it's, it's far away from the 2020 water use cap. So we think that uh, after 2020's number comes out, China will definitely meet the target. Uh, now I'm gonna take a key area as an example uh, to see our autonomic analysis of, of uh, China, of, of the relationship between water resources and uh, economy. So this, uh, the detailed analysis is in our report, uh, which can also be obtained on our web website. So this is the Yangtze River economic belt. Uh, it's a large area, including 11 provinces. And uh, it has almost 200 big cities and the hundreds of power plants and hydropower plants. And uh, a lot of rice and grown here and the, the green dot, as we can see. And uh, also it accounts for China's over 40% of China's population and 45% uh, of China's GDP. It's very important to China. Uh, if we take out YREB, the Yangtze River Economic Belt, uh, to compare it as a, as a country, I can see it has a more population than the US and Indonesia. In terms of GDP, it's, uh, it's larger than Japan and Canada. Apart from this, and this YREB is also very important to the global supply chain, uh, it accounts for uh, over 50% of the uh, chemical, global chemical fiber and uh, antimony and tungsten and uh, heavy rare earth, something like that. So uh, this region is very important. However, uh, this region ha also has a serious water problems. For example, we have down a uh, Based on WRI's uh, water stress map, we've done analysis for different 11 provinces in this region. We can see like for Zhejiang and Jiangsu and Shanghai, these downstream Yellow River Delta regions, which is the most developed regions in YREB. They have, uh, like for Jiangsu, almost all the regions are in dark red, which is extremely high water stressed. Like for Shanghai, almost all the regions are high water stress. So they're facing uh, severe water problems. Uh, we've actually, uh, we've actually uh, have done a chart here and uh, uh, this is our waternomic chart. Uh, the Y axis is the water use per 10,000 GDP and the X axis is, is, is the wastewater wastewater discharge per 10,000 GDP. So the y-axis means the water use efficiency and the x-axis means the, your, your wastewater uh, uh, treatment efficiency. Like for example, for Shanghai and Jiangsu and Zhejiang, uh, the size of the pie chart means the GDP uh, a province generates. For Shanghai, Jiangsu and Zhejiang here in this corner, they're actually uh, good, uh, good performers for, uh, for their waternomics because they use this, uh, very little water and uh, discharges very little wastewater, but at the same time, they are generating uh, a lot of GDP. For example, for these three provinces, for Jiangxi, Guizhou, and Yunnan, uh, they are generating very little GDP, but act. meanwhile, they are using a lot of water and discharging a lot of wastewater. So these three pro uh, provinces need to look their industries uh, and to, to decide and to pick up some water efficient uh, sectors and to dump some like polluting and uh, water consuming sectors like that. Uh, in terms of the water use target, uh, here Jiangsu is definitely the biggest water user uh, in this region. And uh, 
uses a lot of water in agriculture and industry. And also for Jiangsu and uh, the blue bar is the actual water use of Jiangsu in 2017. And the two red bars are the water use caps for Jiangsu for 2020 and 2030. So in 2017, uh, Jiangsu is still far away from its water targets. And uh, uh, since 2020 number hasn't come out, if it turned out that Jiangsu failed to stay within the caps in 2020, like in future in 14th five-year plan, Jiangsu may face uh, like pressures, environmental pressures, like you, like for, for uh, polluting and uh, water consuming companies and the corporates, and they may find themselves more risky uh, operating in Jiangsu and also the same for Anhui, but Anhui's situation is a little better since it's only a little over the, over the cap. And for other provinces, they're fine with their cap. And uh, we think that uh, they would all meet, meet, meet uh, their targets by the end of 2020. Uh, so more detailed analysis, we've done that for each of the provinces in the report and uh, you're welcome to, to read, download and read that report. And uh, in total, and uh, it's very important for China and it will be a target for China to tackle its water problems uh, during its 14th fiber plan. And, uh, and we think China will make it. Mm, that's all, thanks. Thank you very much, Yuan Shao, for this um, very comprehensive overview of the water challenges. Um, and also uh, an overview which gave the um, understanding how much uh, how, how the water situation in each city and each utility sums up to uh, to these um, large scale uh, challenges and problems we have some uh, technical problems with the anticipated uh, next uh, speaker uh, but we hope to solve it so therefore we will continue instead to louis uh, fasca from uh, aquash de portugal and uh, <clears throat> Louis, you're already on with the with the screen. So please um, uh, go ahead with your presentation and uh, um, I will give you a signal when there's one minute left. Okay, good morning. I'm just sharing the presentation. Uh, Hi, Enric. Good morning and good afternoon in China. Uh, good news from Yuan Chao Shu uh, showed that uh, Chinese uh, regarding uh, regarding China's efforts on water usage. I will present you the uh, Santander uh, example is uh, urban water infrastructure infrastructure uh, with a mixed uh, a multi-cross uh, sector approach. Uh, regarding Aguas de Portugal, Aguas de Portugal is a share-owned holding company. Uh, it was founded on 93 with a mission for designing and building and managing uh, water supply and wastewater systems uh, with a, in a framework of economic, social and environmental sustainability. Uh, we cover a uh, full cycle of uh, water, mostly on a multi-region and multi-municipalities framework. Uh, most of our companies, they supply bulk water to municipalities who then distribute and they return it as the wastewater and we treat it and reject it. Uh, we have uh, presently 12 companies uh, work, uh, that uh, uh, cover 80% of our um, uh, of national mainland and uh, we have shared service for energy and uh, added value and also uh, some international um, companies working in mostly in Africa and Asia. Uh, we, we managed uh, 150 wait, uh, water treatment plants. Uh, we count out 
count uh, 1,135 uh, water intakes and we operate uh, 970 wastewater treatment plants. Uh, our network or pipelines are 16,000 kilometers and we have uh, 1,700 reservoirs. Uh, regarding the sewage network is uh, 9,465 kilometers. And regarding wastewater and, pump, uh, and water pumping stations uh, above 2,500. We, we offer a wide range of solutions uh, for different contests. Uh, as I've mentioned before, 80% of the Portuguese uh, population is served by our company. We have made, uh, we have managed and created uh, 12 water supply and sanitation regional utilities from highly density urban areas to rural regions from uh, small decentralized systems to large high tech and smart systems throughout the Portuguese mainland. Now, going to the Agus Santa Andrea case study, it's in the western south uh, part of the country. Uh, we have uh, the, our challenge was um, industrial solid waste uh, coming from major deep water harbor and a major petrochemical hub. We have the biggest um, diesel refinery in Europe. Um, which produce highly polluted effluents. And we also have the problem of the emerging dormitory towns with and the domestic effluents. Um, all these, especially the petro major petrochemical hub and the emerging dormitory towns have a, a huge uh, large scale water demand. So our approach was a multi-cross sector uh, approach. So we have managed in the same uh, company, both systems, the drinking water system, we have a segregated uh, groundwater uh, supply, and then we have the full chain of the our industry. And we also developed a, a fully independent industrial water system, uh, which has an independent water source uh, dam and uh, dedicated uh, water treatment plan and distribution. We then um, collect all the wastewater from the urban, urban uh, area and the industrial um, wastewater from the industry. And we have uh, segregated effluent, uh, effluent collection systems and we treat it in a single urban and industrial industrial uh, wastewater treatment plan and then we reject it in the ocean by a um, submarine uh, hemisphere. We also run the industrial waste uh, landfill which collects, we, we don't collect, we just uh, uh, operate the, the, the landfill. From this approach, we have uh, we have been able to and to use the high organic loads that the domestic effluent uh, uh, wastewater has uh, with the industrial effluent, which it's it's up to seventy percent of total uh, wastewater. Uh, ingression in the wastewater treatment plan, which is lacks of organic load. So we, uh, we can uh, on the, we can use the organic loads that the domestic effluent uh, has and in order to have uh, more efficient treatments and uh, a huge reduction of reagents and chemicals to treat the uh, industrial uh, effluent uh, so, with this uh, econ with this multi cross sector approach, we have uh, reached a higher economy of scales and higher economy of scope. So we have um, decreased capex and opex for operations 
during the uh, with this uh, approach. The expected demand increase for industrial water. We are expecting that uh, more industries will come. Uh, they are very expanding. It's expanding. Rotterdam has reached full capacity in the last year, so we are expecting with this deep water um, harbor, we are getting more ships as the completion of high-speed railway is going forward, and um, also the petrochemical petrochemical plants are uh, expecting to uh, expand their activity activities here in Cines and uh, the, we are expecting the establishment of uh, some uh, hydrogen production plants and they will demand some uh, reused water for producing green hydrogen as we have uh, uh, huge incentives incentives on the hydrogen that is produced with uh, reused water and we are ready to produce. Um, we have made our, our water demand scenarios and water sources and we were expecting for up to 10 uh, billion uh, cubic meters per year. We were, we were using the same uh, water source uh, that we're using now, that's the river. And if the increase of water demand reaches 25 billion, we'll be have, we'll, we will have to connect to an, another dam, uh, which is far away. Uh, and if we, it goes further up to 38 billion, we will need to uh, desalinate water. Uh, what happened is, the hydric stress on superficial water source, the, the river, uh, is we have some problems with uh, water in some years and uh, we have decided to uh, anticipate the uh, Alkeva Dam connection. So I show you, and we have the, at the, the existing dam, uh, which is supplied by the water through the existing pipeline. This is the green one. Uh, it's up to 40 kilometers uh, for the uh, river intake. And we will connect to the Alkeva Dam, which is the biggest uh, artificial water in Europe. And uh, One minute, are, Louis. Yes. And we are um, going to build this new pipeline for taking water to our system. And this is the um, schematics from our wa drinking water system. It's coming from ground water boroughs and the um, industrial water system uh, on the right is coming from the our present dam. So, uh, to keep it short on the eight minutes uh, uh, allocation, this is the case I, will, I had presented to you. Thank you. Henrik? Thank you very much, Louis Feinska, for this interesting case. I'm quite certain we will come back to it when we get to the roundtable uh, yeah. discussion in the end of the webinar. Uh, <clears throat> we will now move on to the... Uh, Speaker from IWA, Mr. Xiao Chang Wang. Uh, I hope you are ready. I don't see the picture of Xiao Chang Wang among the speakers right now. As it seems like we still don't have the connection, I will instead. Ersten Egengren, will you be ready to give your presentation now? Sure. Excellent, Ersten. Thank you very much. Well, good morning and uh, good afternoon. I will talk a bit about the water reuse in a circular economy. Uh, 
we've been looking at wastewater in a similar way for more than 100 years. We started here in Sweden to treat the wastewater by connected with the sea. So we hope that the sea will do the job. We understood after some years that this is not happening. We got problem out in the sea, so we started to treat. Step by step, you have moved from taking away organic to take away phosphor, to take away nitrogen. And now we are talking a lot about pharmaceutical residues, microplastic, and to be honest, I think even if we are doing a good work, we still like here in, in Sweden, we have problem with eutrophication out in the sea because of what we have done during the years. And what is tricky with the ordinary way of thinking, that is to protect environment. At the same time, the better we treat, the more sludge will be produced. So what to do with the sludge? And also we need to recycle the nutrients because we have more population to grow. And it is also a state that we emit a lot of greenhouse gases by running those plants. And I study chemistry myself and I asked the teacher, how can we know that the water is pure enough? And the answer has been during the years, if you are below this COD, below this BOD, below this phosphor and so on. And that reflects what we think is enough treatment for nature. But if we look at the problem worldwide, we must rethink because here we see that with the climate change, the water shortage comes up, even in Sweden, we have water shortage. Unbelievable that we could get this. No one thought about it 10 years ago. And this is going on and will be even worse in, in many places because you will have heavy rain and you are not able to collect it good enough. And then you have areas where you will have very little amount of rain. So this means by looking at the map and you see more detail about the Chinese situation in the former presentations, see there are many, many areas with problems and they are connected with the economy growth like in China, like in India, like in California. So we must really find better solution to this situation. We have tried now in my research institute to focus on something different. We, we call it the production facility. We should see the wastewater, whether it comes from the municipality or industry or farmland. You should see it as something valuable. So you should treat it in a way that the water can be reused, that you produce energy and that you produce nutrients. And we've been working in this direction for a long time. We were not funded in the beginning, but now later on we have funding. So this has been possible to scale up. We are running a quite large pilot demo plant here in Sweden. We can run five different lines, four cubic meter each. In this scale, you can upscale to full scale which is the idea behind it. So here the researchers from all over the world can come and do testing and research together with us. For the moment, we have been running the first MBR plant here in Sweden. It will be installed in Stockholm and will be one of the largest in the world. But we have also studied how to treat pharmaceutical residues because we find them everywhere in the wastewater. And you cannot say that you, you can see a real problem. Some report says that, but you also understand that it cannot be very good to let out a lot of pharmaceutical residues into the recipient. 
So now in Sweden, we have the tradition using activated sludge, but we also use SPR. So idea is that after conventional treatment, you add ozone to degrade the pharmaceutical residues and other organics. And then you have a polishing with sand filter and activated carbon. So this is now installed in full scale in two cities in Sweden. It is not the legislation because the city want to do it because they don't see why they should not take it away because the price is not so high. And then we found that this water after this treatment reach a quality. So if you just add UV, we see it's possible to reuse to the groundwater or it can be used in the, in the agriculture or in the industry, but not for sure, because they, they must specify the quality criteria they have. And it's very bad in that respect. When I ask industry people, what is the quality that you need? They say the same as before. The same as before has been working for, for a couple of years, but how do you know that you don't need another quality to have even better production. So this, we must rethink more that water can be used in one area and then reused in another area. To convince people that treated wastewater is a good way, we produced a beer called Purest together with a local brewery. We took the wastewater from Stockholm we treated it in the ordinary way, and then we added the final treatment as I described to, to get rid of pharmaceutical residues. The only problem we got was that the water quality was too good. So we had to add some salt, but this has been sold in six uh, sustainable logger shop in Sweden. Uh, in, People uh, think it's quite good. It depends on your, your own, own taste, but it shows that it's, it's probably, you can produce beer from wastewater. And the price is very low. The price for one bottle of beer is two US dollar. The price to treat the water is only one percentage of that. So it gives you an idea that more water can be reused and compared with to produce the fresh water from seawater with reverse osmosis. The energy consumption here is only 20%. The sludge that you are producing must also be taken care of. Biogas is one very good alternative. When you use the sludge, you produce biogas. In Sweden, it is upgraded in many cities as a fuel for the transportation uh, for buses, but even for cars. And this is something that should also be introduced more in, in China. And we are happy now to study this possibility in the city of Rugao. But then also what is left of the biogas, you must find a way that the nitrogen and phosphor goes back to farmland. Sometimes with the sludge, sometimes maybe you need incineration and then recovery from the ashes. So I will end here by saying that the integrated solution, I think, is a way forward. We must see possibility to reuse wastewater, not only from munis municipal wastewater treatment plant, but also from industry and from farmland, I would say. So this is my message. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ersten, for bringing